The Delhi Sultanate Persian, Slauntan Delhi Urdu, Delhi Slauntan was a Muslim sultanate based mostly in Delhi that stretched over large parts of the Indian subcontinent for 320 years 1206 Five dynasties ruled over the Delhi Sultanate sequentially: the Mamluk Dynasty (1206–1290), the Khalji Dynasty (1290–1320), the Tughlaq Dynasty (1320–1414), the Sayyid Dynasty (1414–1451), and the Lodi Dynasty (1451–1526). The Sultanate is noted for being one of the few states to repel an attack by the Mongol Empire, and enthroned one of the few female rulers in Islamic history, Razia Sultana, who reigned from 1236 to 1240. Qutb al Din Abak, a former Turkic Mamluk slave of Muhammad Ghori, was the first Sultan of Delhi, and his Mamluk dynasty conquered large areas of northern India. Afterwards, the Khalji dynasty was also able to conquer most of central India, but both failed to conquer the whole of the Indian subcontinent. The Sultanate reached the peak of its geographical reach during the Tughlaq dynasty, occupying most of the Indian subcontinent. This was followed by decline due to Hindu reconquests, states such as the Vijayanagara Empire asserting independence, and new Muslim sultanates such as the Bengal Sultanate breaking off. During and in the Delhi Sultanate, there was a synthesis of Indian civilization with that of Islamic civilization, and the further integration of the Indian subcontinent with a growing world system and wider international networks spanning large parts of Afro Eurasia, which had a significant impact on Indian culture and society, as well as the wider world. The time of their rule included the earliest forms of Indo-Islamic architecture, increased growth rates in India's population and economy, and the emergence of the Hindi-Urdu language. The Delhi Sultanate was also responsible for repelling the Mongol Empire's potentially devastating invasions of India in the 13th and 14th centuries. However, the Delhi Sultanate also caused large-scale destruction and desecration of temples in the Indian subcontinent. In 1526, the Sultanate was conquered and succeeded by the Mughal Empire. Topic. Background Topic. The context behind the rise of the Delhi Sultanate in India was part of a wider trend affecting much of the Asian continent, including the whole of Southern and Western Asia, the influx of nomadic Turkic peoples from the Central Asian steppes. This can be traced back to the 9th century, when the Islamic Caliphate began fragmenting in the Middle East, where Muslim rulers in rival states began enslaving non-Muslim nomadic Turks from the Central Asian steppes, and raising many of them to become loyal military slaves called Mamluks. Soon, Turks were migrating to Muslim lands and becoming Islamicized. Many of the Turkic Mamluk slaves eventually rose up to become rulers, and conquered large parts of the Muslim world, establishing Mamluk sultanates from Egypt to Afghanistan, before turning their attention to the Indian subcontinent. It is also part of a longer trend predating the spread of Islam. Like other settled, agrarian societies in history, those in the Indian subcontinent have been attacked by nomadic tribes throughout its long history. In evaluating the impact of Islam on the subcontinent, one must note that the northwestern subcontinent was a frequent target of tribes raiding from Central Asia in the pre-Islamic era. In that sense, the Muslim intrusions and later Muslim invasions were not dissimilar to those of the earlier invasions during the first millennium. By 962 AD, Hindu and Buddhist kingdoms in South Asia were under a wave of raids from Muslim armies from Central Asia. Among them was Mahmud of Ghazni, the son of a Turkic Mamluk military slave, who raided and plundered kingdoms in North India from east of the Indus River to west of Yamuna River 17 times between 997 and 1030. Mahmud of Ghazni raided the treasuries but retracted each time, only extending Islamic rule into western Punjab. The wave of raids on North Indian and Western Indian kingdoms by Muslim warlords continued after Mahmud of Ghazni. The raids did not establish or extend permanent boundaries of their Islamic kingdoms. The Ghurid Sultan Mu. Is ad Din Muhammad Ghori, commonly known as Muhammad of Ghor, began a systematic war of expansion into North India in 1173. He sought to carve out a principality for himself by expanding the Islamic world. Muhammad of Ghor sought a Sunni Islamic kingdom of his own extending east of the Indus River, and he thus laid the foundation for the Muslim kingdom called the Delhi Sultanate. 
Some historians chronicle the Delhi Sultanate from 1192 due to the presence and geographical claims of Muhammad Ghori in South Asia by that time. Ghori was assassinated in 1206, by Ism Ili Shia Muslims in some accounts or by Hindu Kokars in others. After the assassination, one of Ghori S slaves or Mamluks, Arabic, Malauk the Turkic Qutb al-Din Abak, assumed power, becoming the first Sultan of Delhi. Topic: <laughs> Sultans of Delhi Sultanate. Topic. Topic: Dynasties. Topic. Topic. Mamluk – Slave Topic. Qutb al-Din Abak, a former slave of Mu'az ad-Din Muhammad Ghori known more commonly as Muhammad of Ghor, was the first ruler of the Delhi Sultanate. Abak was of Cuman Kipchak Turkic origin, and due to his lineage, his dynasty is known as the Mamluk slave dynasty not to be confused with the Mamluk dynasty of Iraq or the Mamluk dynasty of Egypt. Abak reigned as the Sultan of Delhi for four years, from 1206 to 1210. After Abak died, Aram Shah assumed power in 1210, but he was assassinated in 1211 by Shams ud Din Iltutmish. Iltutmish's power was precarious, and a number of Muslim emirs nobles challenged his authority as they had been supporters of Qutb al-Din Abak. After a series of conquests and brutal executions of opposition, Iltutmish consolidated his power. His rule was challenged a number of times, such as by Qubasha, and this led to a series of wars. Iltutmish conquered Multan and Bengal from contesting Muslim rulers, as well as Ranthambore and Sawalik from the Hindu rulers. He also attacked, defeated, and executed Taj al Din Yildiz, who asserted his rights as heir to Mu. Is ad din Muhammad Ghori. Iltutmish's rule lasted till 1236. Following his death, the Delhi Sultanate saw a succession of weak rulers, disputing Muslim nobility, assassinations, and short lived tenures. Power shifted from Rukin ud din Firuz to Razia Sultana and others, until Gia's ud din Balban came to power and ruled from 1266 to 1287. He was succeeded by 17-year-old Muis Ud Din Kakabad, who appointed Jalal Ud Din Firuz Khalji as the commander of the army. Khalji assassinated Kakabad and assumed power, thus ending the Mamluk dynasty and starting the Khalji dynasty. Qutb al-Din Abak initiated the construction of the Qutb Minar and the Qawat ul-Islam Mosque, now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It was built from the remains of 27 demolished Hindu and Jain temples. The Qutb Minar complex or Qutb complex was expanded by Iltutmish, and later by Allah ud Din Khalji the second ruler of the Khalji dynasty in the early 14th century. During the Mamluk dynasty, many nobles from Afghanistan and Persia migrated and settled in India, as West Asia came under Mongol siege. Khaljis <laughs> The Khalji dynasty was of Turco-Afghan heritage. They were originally of Turkic origin. They had long been settled in present-day Afghanistan before proceeding to Delhi in India. The name, Khalji, refers to an Afghan village or town known as Kualat-e-Khalji which was established by Khalij people who settled in present-day Afghanistan. Sometimes they were treated by others as ethnic Afghans due to their intermarriages with local Afghans, adoption of Afghan habits and customs. As a result of this, the dynasty is sometimes referred to as Turco-Afghan. The dynasty later also had Indian ancestry, through Jatyapali daughter of Ramachandra of Devagiri, wife of Aladdin Khalji and mother of Shihabuddin Omar. The first ruler of the Khalji dynasty was Jalal ud Din Firuz Khalji. Firuz Khalji had already gathered enough support among the Afghans for taking over the crown. He came to power in 1290 after killing the last ruler of the Mamluk dynasty, Muis ud Din Kakabad, with the support of Afghan and Turkic nobles. He was around 70 years old at the time of his ascension, and was known as a mild-mannered, humble and kind monarch to the general public. 
Jalal ud Din Firuz was of Turkic Kalaj origin, and ruled for six years before he was murdered in 1296 by his nephew and son in law Juna Muhammad Kalji, who later came to be known as Allah ud Din Kalji. Allah ud Din began his military career as governor of Kara province, from where he led two raids on Malwa 1292 and Devagiri 1294 for plunder and loot. His military campaigning returned to these lands as well other South Indian kingdoms after he assumed power. He conquered Gujarat, Ranthambore, Chittor, and Malwa. However, these victories were cut short because of Mongol attacks and plunder raids from the northwest. The Mongols withdrew after plundering and stopped raiding northwest parts of the Delhi Sultanate. After the Mongols withdrew, Allah ud Din Khalji continued expanding the Delhi Sultanate into southern India with the help of generals such as Malik Kafir and Khusro Khan. They collected lots of war booty from those they defeated. His commanders collected war spoils and paid Ghanima Arabic, al a tax on spoils of war, which helped strengthen the Khalji rule. Among the spoils was the Warangal loot that included the famous Ko i Noor diamond. Allah ud Din Khalji changed tax policies, raising agriculture taxes from 20% to 50% payable in grain and agricultural produce, eliminating payments and commissions on taxes collected by local chiefs, banned socialization among his officials as well as intermarriage between noble families to help prevent any opposition forming against him, and he cut salaries of officials, poets, and scholars. These tax policies and spending controls strengthened his treasury to pay the keep of his growing army. He also introduced price controls on all agriculture produce and goods in the kingdom, as well as controls on where, how, and by whom these goods could be sold. Markets called Shahana i Mandi were created. Muslim merchants were granted exclusive permits and monopoly in these Mandis to buy and resell at official prices. No one other than these merchants could buy from farmers or sell in cities. Those found violating these mandi rules were severely punished, often by mutilation. Taxes collected in the form of grain were stored in the kingdom's storage. During famines that followed, these granaries ensured sufficient food for the army. Historians note Allah ud Din Khalji as being a tyrant. Anyone Allah ud Din suspected of being a threat to this power was killed along with the women and children of that family. In 1298, between 15,000 and 30,000 people near Delhi, who had recently converted to Islam, were slaughtered in a single day, due to fears of an uprising. He is also known for his cruelty against kingdoms he defeated in battle. After Allah ud Din S. Death in 1316, his eunuch general Malik Kafir, who was born in a Hindu family in India and had converted to Islam, tried to assume power. He lacked the support of Persian and Turkic nobility and was subsequently killed. The last Khalji ruler was Allah ud Din Khalji's 18-year-old son Qutbud Din Mubarak Shah Khalji, who ruled for four years before he was killed by Khusro Khan, another of Allah ud Din's generals. Khusro Khan S reign lasted only a few months, when Ghazi Malik, later to be called Jiath al-Din Tughlaq, killed him and assumed power in 1320, thus ending the Khalji dynasty and starting the Tughlaq dynasty. Tughlaq The Tughlaq dynasty lasted from 1320 to nearly the end of the 14th century. The first ruler Ghazi Malik rechristened himself as Jiath al-Din Tughlaq and is also referred to in scholarly works as Tughlaq Shah. He was of Turco-Indian origins, his father was a Turkic slave and his mother was a Hindu. Jiath al-Din ruled for five years and built a town near Delhi named Tughlaqabad. According to some historians such as Vincent Smith, he was killed by his son Juna Khan, who then assumed power in 1325. Juna Khan rechristened himself as Muhammad bin Tughlaq and ruled for 26 years. During his rule, Delhi Sultanate reached its peak in terms of geographical reach, covering most of the Indian subcontinent. Muhammad bin Tughlaq was an intellectual, with extensive knowledge of the Quran, fiqh, poetry, and other fields. He was also deeply suspicious of his kinsmen and wazirs, ministers, extremely severe with his opponents, and took decisions that caused economic upheaval. For example, he ordered minting of coins from base metals with face value of silver coins, a decision that failed because ordinary people minted counterfeit coins from base metal they had in their houses and used them to pay taxes and jizya. 
on another occasion, after becoming upset by some accounts, or to run the Sultanate from the center of India by other accounts, Muhammad bin Tughlaq ordered the transfer of his capital from Delhi to Devagiri in modern-day Maharashtra renaming it to Dalatabad, by forcing the mass migration of Delhi's population. Those who refused were killed. One blind person who failed to move to Dalatabad was dragged for the entire journey of forty days, the man died, his body fell apart, and only his tied leg reached Dalatabad. The capital move failed because Dalatabad was arid and did not have enough drinking water to support the new capital. The capital then returned to Delhi. Nevertheless, Muhammad bin Tughlaq S orders affected history as a large number of Delhi Muslims who came to the Deccan area did not return to Delhi to live near Muhammad bin Tughlaq. This influx of the then Delhi residents into the Deccan region led to a growth of Muslim population in central and southern India. Muhammad bin Tughlaq S adventures in the Deccan region also marked campaigns of destruction and desecration of Hindu and Jain temples, for example the Swayambhu Shiva Temple and the Thousand Pillar Temple. Revolts against Muhammad bin Tughlaq began in 1327, continued over his reign, and over time the geographical reach of the Sultanate shrunk. The Vijayanagara Empire originated in southern India as a direct response to attacks from the Delhi Sultanate, and liberated South India from the Delhi Sultanate's rule. In 1337, Muhammad bin Tughlaq ordered an attack on China, sending part of his forces over the Himalayas. Few survived the journey, and they were executed upon their return for failing. During his reign, state revenues collapsed from his policies such as the base metal coins from 1329 to 1332. To cover state expenses, he sharply raised taxes. Those who failed to pay taxes were hunted and executed. Famines, widespread poverty, and rebellion grew across the kingdom. In 1338 his own nephew rebelled in Malwa, whom he attacked, caught, and flayed alive. By 1339, the eastern regions under local Muslim governors and southern parts led by Hindu kings had revolted and declared independence from the Delhi Sultanate. Muhammad bin Tughlaq did not have the resources or support to respond to the shrinking kingdom. The historian Walford chronicled Delhi and most of India faced severe famines during Muhammad bin Tughlaq's rule in the years after the base metal coin experiment. By 1347, the Bahmani Sultanate had become an independent and competing Muslim kingdom in Deccan region of South Asia. Muhammad bin Tughlaq died in 1351 while trying to chase and punish people in Gujarat who were rebelling against the Delhi Sultanate. He was succeeded by Firuz Shah Tughlaq (1351–1388), who tried to regain the old kingdom boundary by waging a war with Bengal for 11 months in 1359. However, Bengal did not fall. Firuz Shah ruled for 37 years. His reign attempted to stabilize the food supply and reduce famines by commissioning an irrigation canal from the Yamuna River. An educated sultan, Firuz Shah left a memoir. In it he wrote that he banned the practice of torture, such as amputations, tearing out of eyes, sawing people alive, crushing people's bones as punishment, pouring molten lead into throats, setting people on fire, driving nails into hands and feet, among others. He also wrote that he did not tolerate attempts by Rafawis Shia Muslim and Mahdi sects from proselytizing people into their faith, nor did he tolerate Hindus who tried to rebuild temples that his armies had destroyed. As punishment for proselytizing, Firuz Shah put many Shias, Mahdi, and Hindus to death Firuz Shah Tughlaq also lists his accomplishments to include converting Hindus to Sunni Islam by announcing an exemption from taxes and jizya for those who convert, and by lavishing new converts with presents and honours. Simultaneously, he raised taxes and jizya, assessing it at three levels, and stopping the practice of his predecessors who had historically exempted all Hindu Brahmins from the jizya. He also vastly expanded the number of slaves in his service and those of Muslim nobles. The reign of Firuz Shah Tughlaq was marked by reduction in extreme forms of torture, eliminating favors to select parts of society, but also increased intolerance and persecution of targeted groups. The death of Firuz Shah Tughlaq created anarchy and disintegration of the kingdom. 
The last rulers of this dynasty both called themselves Sultan from 1394 to 1397, Nasir ud-Din Mahmud Shah Tughlaq, the grandson of Firuz Shah Tughlaq who ruled from Delhi, and Nasir ud-Din Nusrat Shah Tughlaq, another relative of Firuz Shah Tughlaq who ruled from Ferozabad, which was a few miles from Delhi. The battle between the two relatives continued till Timur's invasion in 1398. Timur, also known as Tamerlane in Western scholarly literature, was the Turkic ruler of the Timurid Empire. He became aware of the weakness and quarreling of the rulers of the Delhi Sultanate, so he marched with his army to Delhi, plundering and killing all the way. Estimates for the massacre by Timur in Delhi range from 100,000 to 200,000 people. Timur had no intention of staying in or ruling India. He looted the lands he crossed, then plundered and burnt Delhi. Over five days, Timur and his army raged a massacre. Then he collected and carried the wealth, captured women and slaves particularly skilled artisans, and returned to Samarkand. The people and lands within the Delhi Sultanate were left in a state of anarchy, chaos, and pestilence. Nasir ud Din Mahmud Shah Tughlaq, who had fled to Gujarat during Timur's invasion, returned and nominally ruled as the last ruler of Tughlaq dynasty, as a puppet of various factions at the court. Topic. Said The Said dynasty was a Turkic dynasty that ruled the Delhi Sultanate from 1415 to 1451. The Timurid invasion and plunder had left the Delhi Sultanate in shambles, and little is known about the rule by the Said dynasty. Anne-Marie Schimmel notes the first ruler of the dynasty as Khazir Khan, who assumed power by claiming to represent Timur. His authority was questioned even by those near Delhi. His successor was Mubarak Khan, who rechristened himself as Mubarak Shah and tried to regain lost territories in Punjab, unsuccessfully. With the power of the Sayyid dynasty faltering, Islam's history on the Indian subcontinent underwent a profound change, according to Shimmel. The previously dominant Sunni sect of Islam became diluted, alternate Muslim sects such as Shia rose, and new competing centers of Islamic culture took roots beyond Delhi. The Sayyid dynasty was displaced by the Lodi dynasty in 1451. Lodi The Lodi dynasty belonged to the Pashtun Afghan Lodi tribe. Balul Khan Lodi started the Lodi dynasty and was the first Pashtun to rule the Delhi Sultanate. Balul Lodi began his reign by attacking the Muslim Janpur Sultanate to expand the influence of the Delhi Sultanate, and was partially successful through a treaty. Thereafter, the region from Delhi to Varanasi, then at the border of Bengal Province, was back under influence of Delhi Sultanate. After Balul Lodi died, his son Nizam Khan assumed power, rechristened himself as Sikandar Lodi and ruled from 1489 to 1517. One of the better known rulers of the dynasty, Sikandar Lodi expelled his brother Barbak Shah from Janpur, installed his son Jalal Khan as the ruler, then proceeded east to make claims on Bihar. The Muslim governors of Bihar agreed to pay tribute and taxes, but operated independent of the Delhi Sultanate. Sikandar Lodi led a campaign of destruction of temples, particularly around Mathura. He also moved his capital and court from Delhi to Agra, an ancient Hindu city that had been destroyed during the plunder and attacks of the early Delhi Sultanate period. Sikandar thus erected buildings with Indo-Islamic architecture in Agra during his rule, and the growth of Agra continued during the Mughal Empire. After the end of Delhi Sultanate, Sikandar Lodi died a natural death in 1517, and his second son Ibrahim Lodi assumed power. Ibrahim did not enjoy the support of Afghan and Persian nobles or regional chiefs. Ibrahim attacked and killed his elder brother Jalal Khan, who was installed as the governor of Janpur by his father and had the support of the emirs and chiefs. Ibrahim Lodi was unable to consolidate his power, and after Jalal Khan's death, the governor of Punjab, Daulat Khan Lodi, reached out to the Mughal Babur and invited him to attack Delhi Sultanate. Babur defeated and killed Ibrahim Lodi in the Battle of Panipat in 1526. The death of Ibrahim Lodi ended the Delhi Sultanate, and the Mughal Empire replaced it. Economy <inaudible> <inaudible> Topic. Before and during the Delhi Sultanate, Islamic civilization was the most cosmopolitan civilization of the Middle Ages. 
It had a multicultural and pluralistic society, and wide ranging international networks, including social and economic networks, spanning large parts of Afro Eurasia, leading to escalating circulation of goods, peoples, technologies, and ideas. While initially disruptive due to the passing of power from native Indian elites to Turkic Muslim elites, the Delhi Sultanate was responsible for integrating the Indian subcontinent into a growing world system, drawing India into a wider international network, which led to cultural and social enrichment in the Indian subcontinent. Economist Angus Madison has estimated that, during the medieval Delhi Sultanate era, between 1000 and 1500, India's GDP grew nearly 80% up to $60.5 billion in 1500. The worm gear roller cotton gin was invented in the Indian subcontinent during the early Delhi Sultanate era of the 13th-14th centuries, and is still used in India through to the present day. Another innovation, the incorporation of the crank handle in the cotton gin, first appeared in the Indian subcontinent some time during the late Delhi Sultanate or the early Mughal Empire. The production of cotton, which may have largely been spun in the villages and then taken to towns in the form of yarn to be woven into cloth textiles, was advanced by the diffusion of the spinning wheel across India during the Delhi Sultanate era, lowering the costs of yarn and helping to increase demand for cotton. The diffusion of the spinning wheel, and the incorporation of the worm gear and crank handle into the roller cotton gin, led to greatly expanded Indian cotton textile production. Demographics Topic. The Indian population had largely been stagnant at 75 million during the Middle Kingdom's era from 1 AD to 1000 AD. During the medieval Delhi Sultanate era from 1000 to 1500, India experienced lasting population growth for the first time in a thousand years, with its population increasing nearly 50% to 110 million by 1500 AD. Topic. Culture Topic. While the Indian subcontinent has had invaders from Central Asia since ancient times, what made the Muslim invasions different is that unlike the preceding invaders who assimilated into the prevalent social system, the successful Muslim conquerors retained their Islamic identity and created new legal and administrative systems that challenged and usually in many cases superseded the existing systems of social conduct and ethics, even influencing the non-Muslim rivals and common masses to a large extent, though the non-Muslim population was left to their own laws and customs. They also introduced new cultural codes that in some ways were very different from the existing cultural codes. This led to the rise of a new Indian culture which was mixed in nature, different from ancient Indian culture. The overwhelming majority of Muslims in India were Indian natives converted to Islam. This factor also played an important role in the synthesis of cultures. The Hindustani language Hindi -Urdu began to emerge in the Delhi Sultanate period, developed from the Middle Indo Aryan Apabramsha vernaculars of North India. Amir Khusro, who lived in the 13th century CE during the Delhi Sultanate period in North India, used a form of Hindustani, which was the lingua franca of the period, in his writings and referred to it as Hindavi. Military The bulk of Delhi Sultanate's army consisted of nomadic Turkic Mamluk military slaves, who were skilled in nomadic cavalry warfare. A major military contribution of the Delhi Sultanate was their successful campaigns in repelling the Mongol Empire's invasions of India, which could have been devastating for the Indian subcontinent, like the Mongol invasions of China, Persia and Europe. The Delhi Sultanate's Mamluk army were skilled in the same style of nomadic cavalry warfare used by the Mongols, making them successful in repelling the Mongol invasions, as was the case for the Mamluk Sultanate of Egypt. Were it not for the Delhi Sultanate, it is possible that the Mongol Empire may have been successful in invading India. The strength of the armies changes according to time. According to Farishta during the Battle of Kilia Laden led an army of 300,000 cavalry and 2,700 elephants. During the Tughlaq period Muhammad bin Tughlaq rose an army of three million. The soldiers used weapons such as swords, spears, shields etc. Armor such as steel helmet and chainmail was commonly used. Armored war elephants were effectively used against the enemies such as the Mongols. <laughs> Temple desecration 
Historian Richard Eaton has tabulated a campaign of destruction of idols and temples by Delhi sultans, intermixed with instances of years where the temples were protected from desecration. In his paper, he has listed 37 instances of Hindu temples being desecrated or destroyed in India during the Delhi Sultanate, from 1234 to 1518, for which reasonable evidences are available. He notes that this was not unusual in medieval India, as there were numerous recorded instances of temple desecration by Hindu and Buddhist kings against rival Indian kingdoms between 642 and 1520, involving conflict between devotees of different Hindu deities, as well as between Hindus, Buddhists and Jains. He also noted there were also many instances of Delhi sultans, who often had Hindu ministers, ordering the protection, maintenance and repairing of temples, according to both Muslim and Hindu sources. For example, a Sanskrit inscription notes that Sultan Muhammad bin Tughluq repaired a Shiva temple in Bidar after his Deccan conquest. There was often a pattern of Delhi sultans plundering or damaging temples during conquest, and then patronizing or repairing temples after conquest. This pattern came to an end with the Mughal Empire, where Akbar the Great's chief minister Abu El Fazl criticized the excesses of earlier sultans such as Mahmud of Ghazni. In many cases, the demolished remains, rocks, and broken statue pieces of temples destroyed by Delhi sultans were reused to build mosques and other buildings. For example, the Qutb complex in Delhi was built from stones of 27 demolished Hindu and Jain temples by some accounts. Similarly, the Muslim mosque in Kanapur, Maharashtra, was built from the looted parts and demolished remains of Hindu temples. Muhammad bin Bakhtiar Khalji destroyed Buddhist and Hindu libraries and their manuscripts at Nalanda and Odantapuri universities in 1193 AD at the beginning of the Delhi Sultanate. The first historical record of a campaign of destruction of temples and defacement of faces or heads of Hindu idols lasted from 1193 through the early 13th century in Rajasthan, Punjab, Haryana, and Uttar Pradesh under the command of Guri. Under the Khaljis, the campaign of temple desecration expanded to Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat and Maharashtra, and continued through the late 13th century. The campaign extended to Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka and Tamil Nadu under Malik Kafir and Ula Khan in the 14th century, and by the Bahmanis in 15th century. Orissa temples were destroyed in the 14th century under the Tughlaqs. Beyond destruction and desecration, the sultans of the Delhi Sultanate in some cases had forbidden reconstruction of damaged Hindu, Jain and Buddhist temples, and they prohibited repairs of old temples or construction of any new temples. In certain cases, the sultanate would grant a permit for repairs and construction of temples if the patron or religious community paid jizya fee, tax. For example, a proposal by the Chinese to repair Himalayan Buddhist temples destroyed by the Sultanate army was refused, on the grounds that such temple repairs were only allowed if the Chinese agreed to pay jizya tax to the treasury of the Sultanate. In his memoirs, Firas Shah Tughlaq describes how he destroyed temples and built mosques instead and killed those who dared build new temples. Other historical records from wazirs, emirs and the court historians of various sultans of the Delhi Sultanate describe the grandeur of idols and temples they witnessed in their campaigns and how these were destroyed and desecrated. See also Topic. Mongol invasions of India Delhi Sultanate literature Iconoclasm Ibrahim Lodi's tomb Persianate states Tomb of Balul Lodi Turkish slaves in the Delhi Sultanate Topic. References Topic. Topic. Bibliography Topic. Kumar, Sunil, 2007. The Emergence of the Delhi Sultanate Delhi, Permanent Black Topic. External links Topic. 